So we started electrostatics uh, last time, and all we really talked about was things, charges pushing each other, and it was very touchy-feely, and there were no equations. And you may think that's just me being weird. That's actually how it always starts. If you read the electrostatics chapter, the first half is just about forces pushing on each other and rubbing things, and the difference between metals and insulators and charge moving. That's just kind of how you always start. Right? So, so if you look at the book, that really is how it is. Um, now we're going to get a little bit more mathematical and you know, actually use some equations to describe it and less exciting demos. So this was kind of the fun one. Last time was a fun one. This is the more physics-y one. So it'll be a little bit less 50 shades today than it was uh, Tuesday. But we will get a little bit of interesting insight. And then I'll make a, a short homework uh, that will be due next week. But it'll be due Friday. And it won't be very long because we haven't really covered that much homework kind of stuff. You know. So it, it'll come out soon. I'm just, we've been too busy writing the exam. OK, so last time, let's see. We did talk about Coulomb's law. And we did uh, push on some charges. And I mentioned a little bit about the concept of a dipole being so important. So let's think a little bit about uh, what, what force would a charge near a dipole feel. So this first sort of Coulomb's law calculation will give you an idea of how they get sort of messy looking, but they really aren't that bad. It's just, it's just the, the algebra gets a little tedious, especially if you do them symbolically. Okay, so let's put a dipole here at the origin. And what I mean by a dipole, remember a dipole was uh, this thing when you have opposite charges with some spacing between them. So we're going to put a charge here, one, and a charge here, two. And we're, we say at the origins, so they must be along, uh, we'll say, the y-axis. And uh, at, at the origin, I mean they're centered on the origin. And then uh, this is the x-axis. So we're going to say, let's put the dipole on the y-axis like that. And you've got plus q here, and you've got minus q here. Okay? So you've got a positive charge, number one a negative charge, number two, and we'll separate them by a distance d. So that's a standard way to describe a dipole. Okay? You would say this dipole moment is qd. It's the charge times the displacement, qd, if you were thinking about the moment, which we'll get into much later. Okay? All we really want to do now, though, is do a little bit of Coulomb's law, is we have a dipole at the origin. Um, what force does a charge... And this one will make uh, big Q, big Q, feel. What force does the charge feel along the x-axis? Right. So let's just draw it somewhere on the x-axis. We'll, we'll call it 3, number 3 here. And it's plus Q like that. Right. So what does it feel? It sits at position x. Right. So we know the positions of everything. This, is at 0 d over 2, and this is at 0 minus d over 2, and this is at x0, if we wanted to really give the coordinates. Okay, so what we do is we just add Coulomb's law forces. It's just like last semester, if you have multiple forces on an object, they add up. Therefore, we say, what's the Coulomb's law force due to this charge? What's the Coulomb's force law due to that charge? And we just add them. And that's it. So let's look at our Coulomb's law. The way I suggest you write it is you put two subscripts on the force. One is the one that's generating the force. One is the one that's receiving the force. So let's do 1, 3. Right? F1, 3 means the force that 1 applies to 3. Right? So we're calculating the force on 3. So we're going to do F1, 3, and we're going to do F2, 3. F1, 3. Coulomb's law. K. Coulomb's constant, 9 times 10 to the 9. All right. And then the charge of each one, uh, positive Q, positive big Q, and there you go, over the separation squared. All right. And this is the only reason that Coulomb's law problems get tricky in, uh, in Cartesian coordinates, is you're constantly having to deal with these uh, right triangles, or with these uh, hypotenuses. So you say, oh, here's a right triangle. This is d over 2, and this is x. So this is the square root of d squared over 4. Right? That's just d over 2 squared plus x squared. So you just got to get used to dealing with that and realizing it's not a big deal. It just came from Pythagorean theorem. It's not the end of the world. And here's a bonus. Are you ready? We're going to put that here, and we're going to square it. 
Oh, well, that helps, right? We don't have to do the square root symbol, right? This, this is the square root of this thing, and we have to square it, so we can actually write it a little nicer, d squared over 4 plus x squared, just in the bottom, right? So if you're panicking that the square root is gone, and you're panicking that the 2 is missing there, your panics cancel, OK? A lot of you panic in three ways, and then they can't cancel. I understand. But if you're just panicked in two ways right now, so that is not yet a vector. We haven't put a direction on it. You know the direction from opposites attract, like charges repel. These are both positive. You know the direction is really this way. But right now, let's just do magnitude. There you go. We don't have to think about direction yet. All right, here we go. Now let's look at F23. I bet we can do this one now. OK. Uh, times the negative charge, so it's negative Q over, what is the separation here? Oh, it's the same thing, because this is also D over 2, and that's also X. Same thing. D squared over 4 plus X squared. D, sorry, this is getting too small. And yes, it's the square root of that, but the square root squared, and there it is. And this, um, and then we're going to say we want the magnitude. So that negative actually doesn't matter. If you're just getting the magnitude of the force, sometimes you'll see books put in magnitude bars over the charges, just to tell you, you can put it positive, you can put it negative, it doesn't matter. Later, when we're doing it more detailed with uh, unit vectors, then we'll use those negatives to get the direction correct. But right now, just want magnitude, OK? So there's magnitude over two forces. Very nice. But now. We do have to add them, right? So they're going to add as vectors. So well, now we actually have to draw them properly and say, OK, which way is which one? Positive, positive. They repel, right? And this is uh, negative, positive. Opposites attract. It's going to be that way, right? So when you vector sum those, if you draw it well, Perhaps, it, to your eye, you can see that the horizontal components are going to cancel and the vertical components are going to add. Right? If I was going to draw this with its components, uh, I need to make things like that, give myself room here. If I was going to draw this as a component, I'd say it's a component this way, is the x component of that one, and that way. Right? If I was going to draw this as components, this way and that way. So you can see when you add these two vectors, these two components cancel, and these two add. So you can tell before you even do anything that the sum is going to be something like that. That's F total. Okay. So we can do this with unit vectors, or you can do it graphically with your eyes. It's sort of your choice. We'll do fields with unit vectors. So if you prefer straight up vector calc, we'll do it that way as well. But most people, I think you might prefer just to do some trig and some drawings. Uh, let's see. So if we want to get to the answer, then we got to say um, horizontal components cancel. And we're going to say clearly the vertical components add. I mean, they're both adding, but they don't cancel. They give you a larger number. So now we just have to find the vertical component. It's a right triangle. Nobody's getting hurt here. Right, here it is. Right triangle between these components. That's theta. So it's just opposite over hypotenuse. It's like the sine component of, of the force. So for each one, you would just write, um, so you would just write um, uh, F13 magnitude times the sine of theta plus F23 uh, magnitude times the sine of theta. Right? But what's theta? So another thing I want to point out, one, is you get ugly looking denominators, but that's OK. Two, is that you don't always have to find theta. Right now, we just need the sine of theta. So we don't need theta in degrees. We can just look at the triangle and get the sine of theta. Sine of theta from the triangle. All right, so we look at that triangle and say sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Oh, sine of theta is d over 2 over 
the square root of d squared over 4 plus x squared. See the ugliness that these problems tend to make? Look, it looks horrible, but it's not horrible. That's just opposite over hypotenuse. That is the so in Sokotoa. Okay, that's all it is. It just looks ugly. And you think that looks ugly, now let's multiply it by our vector uh, component. Let's, let's write this thing out now. Oh my god, that's going to be really bad, because we're going to say then the magnitude of the total force, we've already got the direction, we know it's down, we know we just need to add these two components, I'm just going to go straight to the magnitude, is uh, that one, kqq over d squared over 4 plus x squared, not squared, because it's a square root squared, times that, d over 2 over the square root of d squared over 4 plus x squared. Oh my god, what a mess, right? And then, plus the whole thing again, right? Now we're going to write this one, and we're going to multiply it times the sine of theta. And I wrote the k wrong because everybody in the world writes that as a lowercase k, except this book. Uh, k, again, q, q over d squared over 4 plus x squared times the sine d over 2 times the square root of d squared over 4 plus x squared. Oh my god. It's the same expression, we just wrote it twice. Right. Copy paste. Where'd the negative go? Wait, I thought there was a negative there. But you gotta remember, so we're doing the negative sort of in our head. Yes, it's negative. They're both negative. They're both down. If we were doing this strictly mathematically, they're both down and negative. But we're adding two magnitudes that are pointing down. So we're gonna, if we put the negative in here, these would cancel. But they're magnitudes. We're making them positive. Okay? If we don't do it formally mathematically, you have to accept it when I say things like that. It's one or the other. You can't do something half formally mathematically. I mean, you can. Add it together, and what do you get? Let's simplify this. What is d over 2 plus d over 2? A d. No, it's too mean. Okay. K, d, q, q. There's the top. K, d, q, q. K, q, q, d over 2 plus d over 2. Um, and uh, then what's the bottom? These things combine, and that's why you get these crazy to the three halves things when you do this. When you're looking up answers to these problems, you're going to see something to the three halves and think, where did that come from? And the answer is, the distance that you care about is a square root, and you square it for the formula, and it shows up one more time as a square root for the sine, and something to the square root cubed is to the three halves. Right. So you look at that and you say, there's the magnitude of the force of a charge that's near a dipole along that axis, and if you want the direction, we're doing it just by looking at it. Down, based on our vectors we drew. Right? So that looks really nasty and hard, doesn't it? But it tells you something interesting. I mean, it depends on what's interesting to you. Uh, it tells you actually that the force falls off pretty fast as you move away. So the, the reason you do this is you'd say, how does the force behave when you get really far compared to D. And you'd say, well, when you get really far compared to D, then this is really small, and whenever you add something small to something big, you can ignore the thing that's small. Right? So when you're really far away, it becomes over x squared to the 3 halves, which is over x cubed. And that's kind of the interesting thing. When a charge moves away from one of these charges, the force goes down as 1 over x squared, according to Coulomb's law. But if there's a dipole, it goes down as 1 over x cubed. And that's because, and the force is in a different direction. Right? So just the interaction is weaker because these two things are kind of canceling. Most of their forces cancel. Right? The farther you get away, the more the force is horizontal, and the horizontal part cancels. All you're left is a little vertical part. So as you get farther and farther away, you're just getting the little vertical part. And that's why it goes as x cubed. You can imagine if we were doing this numerically, this wouldn't be as bad. Right? It just looks ugly because we're doing it symbolically. If you're doing it numerically, you've just got numbers, and you just got to calculate sine theta as a number. It's not quite as bad. So you'll do a mixture of those as we go forward. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's do one now numerically that's not nearly as ugly. That was just, I did that one first to show you how bad it can get, how, what you're up against here. 
Let's look at something numerical and a little bit more user friendly here um, and quantitative. Here we go. Let's see. That was a dipole. Now let's go back to just um, a charge. So let's, I want you to imagine a shrinking charge. Okay, here we go. Let's say we have an, uh, a one Coulomb charge here. That's a big charge. If you ever see a Coulomb, just turn around and walk away. You don't want to get close to a Coulomb. Very dangerous. Okay. And like that, you have an axis because we're going to think about um, 40 nanocoulombs, 40 nanocoulombs, uh, 50 centimeters away. Okay, so there we go. So this one is the small one. 40 NCs. So let's say, what is the force on the 40 nanocoulombs? Uh, well, now we just now we're going to do numerical. This isn't so bad, and we're not adding vectors now, right? It's a 1D problem. You know the forces along the axis between them. All we got to do is say force, Coulomb's law, K was 9 times 10 to the 9. Get used to that number. The charge of one times the charge of the other, 1 in MKS units, and then 40 times 10 to the minus 9 in NKS units. If you don't know what nano means here at Rice, instantly fired. No. What do you say to the students? They don't fire them. Suspended. That's the word. Um, that over that, over the separation squared, 50 centimeters, 0.5 squared. There you go. And what do you get? 720 newtons. Wow. That's really big, Professor Hafner. I know. That's a lot of force. Yes. 720 newtons. There's your number. But the reason, so we didn't really do that for the intuition of it, here's what I want to think about, is what if it is a 20 nanocoulomb force? I'm sorry, what if it's a 20 nanocoulomb charge? So now we're going to shrink it down to 20 nanocoulombs. What's the answer going to be? 360 newtons, right? Because it's half. And the force you get is just proportional to that. So you cut that in half, you cut that in half. 360, I did that right. Right? What if it is a 10 nanocoulomb charge? 180 newtons. Right? What if it gets down to 2 nanocoulombs? Ooh, I don't think I can do that one. 36 newtons. Ooh, what if it gets down to 1 nanocoulomb? Uh, 18 newtons. Which way have all these things been? Force, axis, charges are both positives. So they must be that way. Uh, so they've all been to the right. I meant to be writing that. To the right. Because the next one is what if it is minus 1 nanocoulomb, same magnitude, Newton, but it'll be to the left. Because right, suddenly opposites are going to attract like that. Okay. So what did the big charge do? The big charge sort of created a condition, is one way to think about it. Uh, the big charge creates a condition in space that causes the force. And you can see it doesn't really seem to care so much about uh, how much it is, right? It's just creating the condition. The force you get depends on how big this charge is. Right? So I'm, I'm making you think about this shrinking charge idea because we're now going to talk about a conceptual thing that is sort of difficult. Um, the way to make any scientific word scarier is to put the word field after it, okay? Like what is... Um, a uh, scary word. Uh, quantum is a scary word. Quantum field. Ooh, that's worse, right? Electromagnetic isn't so bad. Electromagnetic field. See how much worse that is? See how much it makes me spit? Okay. Gravita gravity, gravitational, gravitational field. See how much scarier that is? Why is the word field scary? I don't know. What does it mean? I don't even know what it means. What is it? Mathematically, all it means is just a bunch of values, is why it means field, right? A field of wheat is a bunch of 
wheat stalks sticking up like vectors. That's pretty much what it is, okay? So if we were to measure all of your heights as a function of position, we would have a field of heights, right? Because we have all of you on an array, sort of. That would be like a field or all your temperatures, or something like that. Your GPAs would be a sloping field based on how far to the front you sit, something like that, okay? So that's all a field is. It's just an array of numbers. So now we gotta think about, well, what does that mean? What, how do we get an electric field out of this? And this is sort of like a philosophical thing. So uh, philosophy is sort of this field, another use of the word field, where it's sort of people answering very low stakes questions because nobody really cares about what the answer is. I mean, it doesn't really affect us you know, so much. You know, I hope nobody's parent is a philosopher here, I hope. Um, am I really here or am I not really here? It doesn't matter because if I don't work and make money, I'll starve to death. Right? So I don't really care whether I'm really here or not. If there's another universe, I don't really care because I live in this universe. So if you're sort of a practical person, you don't think that much of philosophy. But the one question they do ask is uh, the most important one that's related to the electric field is if a tree falls in the woods and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? All right, this one is important. So now that you've taken the first part of this class, we could all answer the question, right? Does the tree make a sound if no one is there to hear it? Yes, right, because what is sound? Sound is a pressure wave going through the air. Does that pressure wave go through the air if no one is there to hear it? Yes, because sound is a pressure wave in the air, not a person experiencing the pressure wave, okay? <laughs> so let's look at that same concept applied right here. What is an electric field? It's what a charge does to space. That's all it is, okay? So this is exactly like the tree falling in the woods. This one coulomb charge is not seeing the nanocoulomb charge and saying, oh shit, there's a 40 nanocoulomb charge there. I gotta push on it, okay. Oh wait, they dropped it to 20 nanocoulombs. Okay, I'll push a little less. Right? He's not doing that because we're not anthropomorphizing the atoms again, like we do in certain other fields, okay? It doesn't know what's going on. It's just sitting there. And if you put a charge here, it creates a force on that charge. And if you make the charge half as big, a smaller force is applied. But it's not thinking about that. Because what if you put a charge here also? It doesn't say, oh my god, okay. I gotta push on both, I gotta push on both, and it's watching for another one, not happening, right? All it's doing is existing, and it's creating a condition in space. It's just what a charge does to space. This is the intellectual leap. It's bigger than it sounds, okay? Okay, so when, uh, let's see. So what we want to think about then is how are we going to describe it mathematically? What is it doing? What charge of space? It, well, I kind of said it there. It creates a condition um, that causes a force to another thing. So what we want to do is just describe that condition mathematically. Right? Here we go. That's what I meant to say. Describe the condition mathematically. So that's what we're going to do here. Right? So here we've got our one Coulomb charge. There it is. But we're just going to call it Q, jumping between numerical and symbolic here. So there's our charge Q. And we're going to say over here, we're going to put a charge a little Q. So this is what we'll call the test charge. And when you have two charges and you're thinking about the forces in the fields, really one of them is not special. They're both equivalent. We could call this the test charge. But just when you're first starting to think about it, it's best to say, this is the big charge. It's established at the origin, and it's pushing on everything else. And I'd have to think the other way. So this is the big, heavy uh, charge. This is the one that we move around. Oh, let's put it here. Let's cut its charge in half. Let's put it over here, right? This is the test charge we're using to figure out what's going on, okay? Everything between two charges happens on the axis between them. Anytime you're having to do vector components and add things together, it's because you have three charges, right? The reason we had to do trig here is because these were not on the same line. They're on different lines. If they're on the same line, then it all happens along this axis. There's nothing else that could happen. Let's see, so we have big Q here, we have little Q here. Now we have to think a little bit about vectors. Now we gotta get mathematical here. So we're gonna draw a vector like this and call it R. And it's just the position vector from big Q to little Q, like that, R Q Q. And now, okay, just take a deep breath. We're gonna write a unit vector. Unit vector just means 
This is how we assign this direction, r hat, big Q to Q. That is a vector, just like any other vector. It has a magnitude of 1, and it points that way. This vector has a magnitude of, it looks like, about 80 centimeters, and it points that way. This has a magnitude of 1, and it points that way. Should I have drawn it longer? Probably. But I can do whatever units uh, I want. I'll say this is a unit of 5, therefore this is a unit of 1. Okay? Usually we draw the unit vectors little to imply it's just 1, everything else is big. Okay, sorry, that just made it worse. Okay, let's now write Coulomb's law in this mathematical way. So here we're just doing magnitudes and drawing directions. There is a way to formally get it. The full vector form would be uh, k times big Q times little q in this case, right? Over, basically we gotta, to really do it right, we gotta say q, q squared. And that's really a magnitude. You know, if we take this vector square, we're talking about the magnitude squared. I don't want to put the magnitude bars and the vector symbol on it because it's just too much. You freak out. I don't want you to freak out. Because I'm going to freak you out here. We're going to put this on it. R hat QQ. It's just this unit vector. So all it's saying is take this magnitude you would get from Coulomb's law, KQQ over R squared, and to make it a vector, just say which way it points. It points along the axis from big Q to little q is all that's saying. The magnitude of this is 1. So it's not affecting this. It's just a way to give it a direction. It's the exact same thing as writing to the right, or whatever I wrote. Well, here I wrote down, or up, or whatever. Okay. So now we would say, how do we write then the electric field? What are we going to do there? We'd say the electric field then, we use an E. We describe it with an E. And we said it was this idea that as you vary the test charge, it's sort of independent of the test charge. Right? So as we, as we, you know, it's because this is proportional to the test charge, as we change the test charge, the force changes. So what it really is, it's just the force divided by the test charge. Right? As you just say, I want F, I could have put this here, Q to Q. So take the force that Q applies to Q and divide it by Q. So the force, the big charge, applies to the test charge and divide it by the amount of the test charge, is all you do. Right? It's like the force per unit charge. And this makes it independent of what this charge is, because it's proportional to it. So you can see, it's, what you can see is going to cancel out. Right? There's going to be k, big Q, test charge Q, over that r squared, big Q, test charge Q, from r to r, but divided by Q, r hat. Q to Q, right? It just went away. See that? Mathematically, we're just dividing it out. And then we get a new expression. Oh, where's my towels? We get a new expression <coughs> um, that is independent of the test charge. And it's just like the idea we were trying to come up with, is that now we have the electric field, write it really big, the electric field of this point charge, what's left? K is left, Q is left, and now this R, let's talk about this R. When there was a test charge there, we said this R was the sort of the distance from big Q to this test charge. We kind of took the test charge away. And is there any reason this would work here and not here? No, it would work here, it would work here, it would work here, it would work here, because it's spherical. So we don't really need the little Q. We can just call it the distance R big Q. The subscript just means it's the distance from big Q. Right? It's the radial distance from big Q. And it's squared still. That didn't cancel. And then we just need a unit vector. And that just means the direction that you're going. Right? So basically, this is a spherical formula. So this is the E field now. And this is spherical coordinates, really. Although we can do most of our problems in 2D. And uh, this is really with Q at the center. You know, if you put Q at the origin, if you put Q at the origin, you could actually get rid of these Qs. You could just say you're in a spherical coordinate system. So therefore, if the Q's at the origin, then R from the origin. But, but I like to leave the Q on just to remind you that's the idea. All right. So that's how you calculate uh, the electric field for a point charge. What is the unit? Let's see. If F was in Newton's, E is in 
newtons per coulomb is the unit. That's it. It doesn't have a special unit. If you do something very fundamental in this area of physics, you might get the unit named after you, because currently it's just sitting there waiting for someone to claim it. Okay. There's, so what we're going to do, so in the next chapter, as we move forward, is we start thinking in terms of the E field instead of the forces, usually. Because the force always depends on what that charge 3 is. But in physics, we like to be general. Right? We don't want to have something that's, we only learn something if we put a charge there. We want to learn what does the dipole do everywhere. So we'd rather calculate the dipole's electric field than to calculate the force on a certain charge sitting at a certain place. Okay? The only other, there's one more important question philosophers ask and that's relevant to this question is what is the hand of one clan what is the sound of one hand clapping right, you've heard that before right that's exactly what this is what is the force of one charge pushing it's the electric field literally that's the exact analogy this thing is just pushing on nothing but it's pushing everywhere it's like one hand all excited clapping everywhere okay don't think about all that until Saturday, okay? <laughs> so that's sort of the introduction to the electric field. We'll continue it next week. I'll do a little simple homework on this kind of stuff. Do next Friday. But now we'll take the five minute break and then we'll start the review part. I'm very bad at review. I usually don't do a review, but then people get mad that I don't review, do review, but you're gonna see why I don't, because I suck at it, okay? I usually make you more confused with a review than if I don't do a review. But you asked for it, so here we go. Review. I thought a good way to do it would be to look at the formula sheet you're going to have and to point out little things that might be a little bit confusing about the formula sheet. Obviously, we can't review the entire semester. It's all on YouTube. Watch it at like 10x, and you can watch the whole thing. Okay. Um, I feel like standing waves, pretty plug and chug. There's nothing too confusing about that. There's never m equals 0. Everything's reasonably happy with standing waves. So I was going to focus a little bit on interference, and I wanted to say something about the phase difference. I feel like one little problem with interference is we just kind of jumped right into the applications after very briefly saying anything about the phase difference. Okay, So I want to just remind you where it comes from, because as you know, we're very, good at, um, we're very good at coming up with problems that make you really think, do you understand what this phase difference is? Uh, that's so we're working on that. All right. OK, uh, OK, so I'm, I'm not sure how much I'm going to answer questions. Because, let's see, because we've got to get through all this. Phase difference. Delta phi is delta x over, over lambda times 2 pi plus delta phi naught. OK? So remember this, is, so what the phase difference is, is it's sort of the, um, uh, let's see, it indicates the interference condition. What I'm trying to point out here is that it is um, an independent value. Okay? We always say delta x over lambda 2 pi n plus 2 pi equals 2 pi or equals 0, or what does it equal? Remember that it's an independent thing. It is with what difference in phase do two waves show up at a point? All right? it, but it does indicate. So it's the difference in phase at a point, right? but it does indicate the interference condition. So the phase difference doesn't have to be 0, or 2 pi, or pi, or 4 pi, or 8 pi. It could be um, you know, a bunch of things. And you can just calculate it. So I thought, real quick, why don't we uh, sort of point that out? Okay? And what I want to show you is how it varies with different kinds of problems. Because you know, sometimes we're at the phase difference, oh, well, it's always 2tn over lambda. No, it's, it's just this. It's just the path difference. If you're doing speakers, there's no n. If you're doing sound, there's no end, right? So let me just see if I can make this clear real quick by looking at a quick practice problem. Oh my god, questions while I'm sucking at a review is going to make it even worse. Oh. Did you say we won't ever have m equals 0 on the exam? No, I did not say that. I'm going to cover m equals 0. Um, yeah, see, so I'm just terrible at review. OK, here we go. Two speakers, right? Two speakers that are uh, one meter apart. Like that. And we're saying, what's the phase difference? Five meters, but aligned with one of the speakers. What is delta phi? It's actually not an interference question. It's just, what is delta phi? Oh, let's see. Let's start plugging in. Let's see. Um, uh, delta phi is, well, you've got to do the difference in the path. So delta x is just physically the difference in the path. 
for error in sound, sound in error. Okay? So if we call this one 1 and this one 2, then it's how far did 1 go? Uh, we want to do 2 minus 1 or 1 minus 2, it doesn't matter. 2 go minus how far did 1 go? Over what? Lambda. So we're just going to tell you in this problem, because we're moving fast, that lambda is 0.2 meters. Normally you'd be told the frequency, and you'd know that the speed of sound in air is 343, and you would calculate that, right? So 2 minus 1 over that, over lambda times 2 pi, plus the difference in phase is, what if we set it up where these did have a phase difference? This one is doing a pressure wave that's being generated by sine omega t uh, plus pi, and this one is doing a pressure wave that's sine omega t plus pi over 2. So the sources don't have to be in phase. That's why we always often say the sources are in phase. They don't have to be in phase. If we don't say the sources are in phase, then you don't assume they're in phase. Right? So then you'd say this may have a phase difference due to the difference in path to that point, plus it might have a phase difference due to the difference in the initial, uh, uh, or the phase constants. Right? So you'd have to put everything in to get this phase difference. So you would plug all this stuff in. If you don't see it, let's see, x2 would be the square root of 26, obviously, know, right? Because it's 5 and it's 1, Pythagorean theorem, 26, minus 5 over 0.2 times 2 pi plus, and what would this be? The phase constant here is pi over 2. The phase constant here was pi, right? So that is where you could calculate a phase constant, and you get 1.54. Well, this is okay. Let's do a little bit more. This is 3.11, a number. This is minus 1.54, a number, right? That's, pi, that's negative pi over 2, minus pi over 2. This came out to almost pi, 3.14. So you get a number. You get 1.54 radians. Okay? So I'm just trying to stress that the phase difference is just a number. That's why here I wrote it and said that's the phase difference. Right? It, I don't want you to look at that and freak out that it's not equal to 2 pi, it's not equal to 0, it's not equal to pi, because it's independent. Then you use it to figure out if you have constructive or destructive interference. In this case, I accidentally made it where it's pretty close to destructive. Uh, no, it's neither. Pi over 2, it's neither. Okay? So you could figure out if it's constructive or destructive or in between. Or you could have a variable in the expression that you're being asked about. This is what we usually do. There's a thickness in here that you're solving for. So you have to set it equal to 2 pi or pi or 0 and solve for the thickness. That's what we're usually doing. It's constructive. Oh, put 2 pi here and solve for one of these. But just if you saw this formula, and I didn't want you to freak out that it wasn't equal to anything. And that's because this is technically independent. Let's see if these are, any of these are like quick answers. So we get to everything. Okay, we have the film, film equation given. Okay, so I'm only going to answer questions about the actual lecture at the moment. Right? Like if you come to office hours, I'll answer two hours of non lecture. Does the equation change in the end reflect? Okay, these are all just general questions. So we're not doing general questions. How do you know the phase is pi over 2 minus pi? Because I'm subtracting 2 minus 1. What is the phase constant for 2? Shh. Yes, pi over 2. What is the phase constant for 1? Pi. Pi over 2 minus pi. It's equal to the phase constant for 2 minus phase constant for 1. There it is, right there. What else have we got? Um, you pick. You can do 1 minus 2 or 2 minus 1, you'll get the same answer. It's up to you. So, so many things are arbitrary, I know. Why did you do pi over 2 minus pi instead of the other way around? Because I was doing 2 minus 1. You can do 1 minus 2. Be your own freak. Do it your own way. How do you know what the initial phase difference is? So, you would only ever have an initial phase difference if, you're, if it's given to you. We would say, oh, 1 has, uh, like, we'd probably give you equations to show you the phase constant. Or we would say they're in phase, and then there's no initial phase difference. Right? Or, the other thing I want to point out is what this says is delta phi not describes source phase constant, which we talked about here, or differences due to reflections. When we're doing optics, we use this term to say, oh, one had a pi and one had a zero, so pi minus zero is pi. So in optics, we never use it for the source. We use it for the reflection. With speakers, if we use it, we usually use it for the source. Okay? So just be sure you see it. And that's all spelled out here, right? Differences in source phase constant and or differences due to reflections. That's what that means. I wanted you to know what that meant. 
All right. What is the difference between F beat? Okay, we're only doing things that I talk about. Why, when do you, how do you know? Okay, we can't do that. We can't keep up. Okay. Um, okay. Because this is much more important than your question. Because I wrote the exam and then I wrote these. So I, we wrote the exam and I wrote, I wrote some of the exam. So we'd probably rather go over these than answer questions, right? I will answer questions all day and I have a special Bitmoji Valentine. So if you send me a question, you will get a Bitmoji Valentine. One person got it already and I just don't have time to send them right now. And it's basically a Bitmoji of what I think my hair looks like. So you definitely want to get it. Okay. Okay. So another big question is uh, about this stuff is um, the difference between constructive and destructive and when to use m equals zero. I put the board on the side where the boards don't work. Okay. Oh, shit. I don't know, I don't know what to do. I want the screen over there so that the boards work. Um, that's audience right. Uh, maybe that'll make it come on. Uh, I can't make it go away now. There we go. Okay, so another thing then to look at carefully is the difference between constructive and destructive. So what you do is you take that delta phi and you say constructive full wave and destructive is half wave. So when we have that whole equation, we're just saying, oh, 2 phi over 2, pi, two tn over phi equals what? That's what we're saying is delta phi equals 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, because 2 pi is a full wave. And here, for destructive, you're saying it equals pi, 3 pi, 5 pi. And what I want to stress here is here you write it this way, 2 pi times m, and m can equal 0, 1, 2, da, 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 da. Okay? And here, I usually wrote it like this equals m pi, and we say m equals 1, 3, 5. But you can also do this, and the book jumps back and forth. You can say 2 pi times m plus 1 half. m equals 0, 1, 2, okay? Convince yourself that these are the exact same thing. 1 pi, 0 pi, 3, 3 pi, 1, uh, three, 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 3 pi. 5, 5 pi, 2, 2, 2 plus 1, half, 4, and half, 5 pi. I can do it in like half a second. So see how fast you can do it. They're the same thing, okay? The reason I did this in lecture is this is how it started with open closed pipes and tubes and all that kind of open closed business. And I thought that's what it was sticking with. And I never look at the book when I lecture. So I didn't realize for interference, it actually switched to the more traditional m plus a half. They're the same thing. If you do this one, though, you're going to freak out. Why can m be 0? Okay, so maybe stick with what I lectured on. Rather, I think that's the reason I picked it, is to not have even more m equals 0 confusion. Can m be negative? Yes. What do you mean by half wave and full wave? This is the condition that gives you interference. If it's a full wave out, it looks like this. Let me shift this by a full wave. Let me shift it by another full wave. Let's shift it backwards by eight full waves. Right? If it shifts by a full wave, they're always right on top of each other. It's constructive. Let me shift it by half a wave. Oh, destructive. Right? That's full wave, half wave, talking about the shift. Right? So I think a lot of this fundamental stuff I said fast, and we went straight to the applications, which is the problem. Right? Okay, so here's a problem about m equals 0. Okay. Oh, we're actually going. Okay. okay, so here is sort of, we talked about philosophers. Here is a philosophical question. When to use m equals 0? This seems to be the most burning question on campus right now. And here is the answer from the philosopher. It depends on what is asked, unfortunately. So let's have a problem here, and let's see if I can convince you that it depends on what is asked. Here is a speaker emitting, and it is positioned at, uh, here's the origin of an x-axis, and this speaker is at minus point, oh crap, let's see, my notes don't make any sense, uh, point three. That's where that speaker is, that's speaker two, okay? Speaker one can be anywhere. Anywhere. So speaker two is at minus point three, speaker one is at x, 
Okay. So we've got one stationary speaker, one sliding speaker. And the wavelength, which you would get in part A of the problem, that's always the simple part of the problem, is lambda is 0.4 meters. What does he mean the simple part? I mean that 343 meters per second equals the frequency times lambda. So we're often kind of just trying to give you that first part. Let's see. OK, so the question is, for this problem, is this is the sick way we can ask questions, is um, 1 minus 0.3. Uh, what is the closest position for speaker one uh, to the origin that gives constructive interference? And somewhere it would say they're in phase. So there's no phase constant to deal with. Two speakers emitting in phase. What phase? One is at x equals minus 0.3. One moves around. It could be anywhere. As we move it, we know we'll go in cases that are constructive, cases that are destructive. What's the closest one to the origin? What a mess. What a cruel, cruel question. Let's set up our phase constant. Let's not set it to equal to something yet. Let's just say, what is the phase difference Sorry, I meant to say difference. What is the phase difference between these two? Delta x over lambda times 2 pi plus delta phi naught. That's all it is. What is delta x? Well, now we've got to decide, are we going to do 2 minus 1 or 1 minus 2? Let's do 1 minus 2. 1 is x. Right? Uh, and the difference is x minus, and then the other one is minus 0.3. That'd be the difference in their position. Whatever x is, minus, and then whatever the other one is. A minus b is a difference, right? Over 0.4 is the wavelength times 2 pi. And what is delta phi naught? Zero. They're in, speakers are in phase. But now the question was constructive. Do we use m equals 0 or not? That's the question. If you do a bunch of these problems, you'll gain an intuition, and I can look at that and tell you, no, you don't. But since you don't have that intuition, let's just plug it in and see what we get. Right? You just have to do it twice. What if we set it equal to 0? It's not a whole lot of algebra. 0, 0. How could this possibly be 0 if x equals negative 0.3 is the only way it's going to be 0? Right? You could do all the algebra, or you could recognize that the 2 pi goes away, the 0.4 goes away, this term has to be 0. This term is x plus 0.3. So the answer then is x equals minus 0.3. Okay? If you can't follow that algebra, just later, just go do it. Just go through the whole thing. Minus minus becomes plus. Other parts go away. So then the answer is for that one, it must sit right on top of that speaker. It must be at the same place. Okay. I guess that kind of makes sense for m equals 0. That's where they have the no phase difference. That's where they would be on top of each other. Well, just for fun... Why don't I try m equals 1? OK. Everything is exactly the same. See, this tempers my sympathy. It's the same calculation. You can't mess it up. m equals 1 uh, means it's equal to 2 pi. 2 pi m, we want it constructive, right? OK. Well, la, 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 la. Oh, yeah, it's not equal to 0, right? Yeah, so cancels, cancels. You get x plus 0.3 equals 0.4. Right. In this case, it's not zero here. Everything doesn't just go away. Cancels, cancels. There's a one there. This multiplies the other side equals 0.4. X equals 0.1. Ah. Which one is closer to the origin? The M equals one case. Just for your notes later, this is M equals zero. This is M equals one. Okay? So in that case, the answer is M equals one. Or you want to use M equals one. The only way you could intuitively know that ahead is to look at it and say, well, I'm so good at this, I know that m equals 0 is when they're on top of each other, and I know that I have to move a whole wavelength uh, to get another interference constructive condition. So I'd have to move from minus 3 to a whole wavelength would take me to point 0.1. Then you could actually do it that way. I mean, then, then you could, wouldn't you have to do any of the math. Right? It's just it's hard to tell when you're new at these, so it's easier just to plug in 0, plug in 1. You should probably get the difference is a wave, right? which it is. So that's unfortunately the answer, is it's not always the same. There's no universal rule of whether you use m equals 0 or not. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Here's one that I think is about what I was saying. Why do you only use zero if uh, is you have a phase constant difference for a constraint? Yeah, I didn't quite fall in. Um, yeah, okay. Please discuss the small angle approximation and when to justify to use it and how it's not, but I, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Let me see what's next in my notes. That's that. Okay, now it's critical we talk about the path difference of light. This has all been speakers. And for this, we've used this uh, phase uh, difference relationship that says delta x over 2 pi, delta x over 2 pi, I'm sorry, delta x over lambda times 2 pi plus delta phi naught is the phase difference. But what's special about light? It gets a little different, uh, or there's other things to consider. All right, for example, let's look at Young's double slit real quick. And I want you to see that what we did really was the same thing. So in Young's double slit, it's just a case of two different lengths that it's going. It's just like that other problem. One was way back here at negative 0.3, and one takes off from somewhere else. And just we do some geometry to talk about a way to find this number, which is the difference. We do some geometry to find that's d sine theta. Okay, if this is d and the distance, the angle to the screen is theta, the difference is d sine theta. But the equation that we use for Young's double slit to find the maxima is just using that exact same formula. It's saying what is delta x over lambda times 2 pi plus delta phi naught equals, and we want it constructive, 2 pi m. This is all we did to get Young's double slit, except that since it's light, let's be clear, we mean the wavelength in air or in vacuum. We could throw that knot on there. So we don't use that with sound because the sound wavelength doesn't change in a material. We don't deal with that. In light, we do. But just look what happens here. Uh, this is zero because they came from the same source of light. And uh, delta x is d sine theta right, over lambda naught. Uh, 2 pi, that was 0, equals 2 pi m. The 2 pi's go away. You bring the lambda naught over there, and you get d sine theta equals m lambda naught, which is the formula on the equation sheet for Young's double slit. I think I, for put, I forgot to put the naught on it. Okay? But, I mean, you don't have to memorize this. It's on the formula sheet. But there's nothing, there's nothing magical or special. It's literally just this equation is all it is. So then the other thing I want to point out is for when you go into glass. This is the most important thing to know of what's really going on, right? Is what if you have light going through a film? It's very hard to draw, but light going through a film and the wavelength gets shorter. Right? And you want to compare that with the one that reflects and does that. So if you're doing interference through a film, that's what you got. So I want you to see what we're doing when we write 2TN over lambda. Okay, let's think about what we're doing. Delta x over lambda times 2 pi plus delta phi naught equals, and we want it to be constructive, 2 pi m. All right, what is delta x? The actual physical path in meters difference is just 2T. That's all it is, okay? But what is the actual, the, the whole point of keeping up with this 2t is we're counting how many waves it goes through. And the number of waves it goes through doesn't depend just on lambda naught. It depends on lambda naught in the material. So since the index changes the wavelength in the material where the path is actually happening, that's why you don't put lambda naught here. You put lambda naught over n here. Right. See, So that's why we say 2tn over lambda naught times 2 pi. I want you to see it comes from this simple formula, this standard formula, okay? This is the only thing we've done where you'll have the light in uh, a refractive in a medium with a different in. But in problems, you could see, you gotta think, if the light is in a new index where n is not one, this n has to be included. Back here, the light's just in air, so we didn't include it, right? There's no glass here. But here, you're in glass, so you have to include it. So I think we did so many problems, 2TN over lambda naught, that we kind of forgot uh, what it means, right? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, 2T comes from 3T minus T. Yeah, sorry, so I should be more specific. Uh, ray 2 goes 3T, ray 1 goes T, so that's 2T. So we should have gone all the way to the beginning. Get out your rulers and measure, right? 
Um, will we be tested on light intensity? No, I don't think there's any intensity made it on there. That was just for enrichment. Why is delta x sine theta, you just gotta go through the geometry to convince yourself that that's theta, that's a right triangle, d, d sine theta. I don't, I'm not gonna go through that geometry again. So we're gonna run out of time. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, I only have one left. Then we could slow down and answer questions, okay. Um, God, I wish it was showing the... Uh, okay, so the other one I wanted to talk about, is, I'll probably get the equation sheet to come up here now. Laptop. The other one I wanted to talk about is in optics. Let's see. Make sure I'm not missing any important points. I wrote down the critical important points. Um, two speakers, two phase difference of construction, just calculate it, note about the constant, that is getting lambda, maybe two formulas, close, yeah, that's all in there, I said it all. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, geometrical optics and what some things on the formula sheet mean. Let's see, there it is, let's see. So we've been looking at the formula sheet, we talked a lot about interference, feeling good about that. Physical optics, remember, so here you go, the velocity in the medium is C over N, the lambda in the medium is lambda naught over N. And here's your just generic formulas for Young's double slit maxima, single slit minima, all right? You can just follow those M's and everything. So you know, which, in Young's double slit, what does M equals zero mean there? That would be the maximum in the middle because they both went the same, you know, distance. We get into ray optics. There's not as much here. Law of reflection, Snell's law, critical angle, lens maker's equation, and the thin lens equation. So the two little things I wanted to highlight that I think maybe I didn't explain uh, is thoroughly in class. One is um, imaging with a plane interface. Oh yeah, and people ask a lot about Young's, the small angle approximation. I mean, so that's why I gave you the answers both with and without the small angle approximation. So here it is. That's without the small angle approximation. That's why the angle's in there. Here, if you make the small angle approximation, the screen is far away. You can just think in terms of height on the screen. Right? This is if you're not thinking of just the height on the screen. This is if you are thinking of the height on the screen. Same thing here. This is if you're not, if you're not doing the small angle approximation, you actually need the angle. Here is the screen's far away. This is how high the maxima appears, or the minima in this case, okay? So there's not a lot of deep stuff about small angle approximation in interference and diffraction. Um, but this is from section 34.4. So you might wanna look at this again, 34. We had a, I mean, we did it, we had a homework on it. My problem I gave you in the homework about the quarter was not this. That was just a refractive uh, problem about where is the quarter. So it shows that the quarter is in a different place. But you can also do them when there's no angle, when it's coming right at you. It's a slightly different situation. So let's say the standard thing to do is say you have a fish in the water. This is what they do in the chapter. You have an object right here, right? And you have your eye right here. So when you're thinking about these, where is it really problems? And it's like one of these straight on problems. You wanna draw the eye really big. You wanna ask yourself, what angle will the rays take that end up in my eye? And they will diffract, they will refract away from the normal like that, right? But my eye is dumb and my eye says, where is the object? It's here, right? So often then you'd ask sort of a question, the object distance here is S, the image distance here is closer, S prime. Right? So a standard question would be, how much closer is it? Or if my dumb eye sees it here, where is it really? Okay, so the book goes through it pretty carefully. Um, I don't know how fast I can do it, let's see. Um, so what you have to really do is when you do these problems, don't think about what's outside of here. Just look in here, and I'll draw it bigger in here. All right, here's the interface. All right, that's, uh, sorry. Here is, that's what the light's actually doing. That's what your eye thinks the light is doing. So you think of these two angles. We say, notice we defined S and S prime with respect to the interface. We're treating this interface as a lens, basically. 
We have S and S prime defined that way. Now, we're not going to use it with a thin lens equation because it's not a lens, but we can use the object and image distance and think of them in those terms. To do these problems, you have to think about um, theta, I'm going to call it theta 1 and theta 2. You have to think about the angles that these rays approach your eye because that's how you're going to figure out how much closer it is and how much farther it is. Okay? And you have to do the small angles. Okay? So there's two things we can think about here. We can think about how much closer does it appear and how much bigger does it appear. I'm telling you right now, we're not going to do bigger. That's related to angular magnification. We didn't really cover it well. I don't know if there's any homeworks on it. But how much closer we did cover. Right? So let's just look and see if we can figure it out real quick. If we, things that we know, this is the thing that is the same. We'll call it L. That's the same for both triangles. So we want to use that somehow. The other things that we know are the object and image distance. So we want to use tangents. Right? The tangent of theta 1 is what? Opposite over adjacent. L over S, where the object really is. The tangent of theta 2 is L over S prime. Right? So we can think about the angles that way. But we also have information from Snell's law. Right? Snell. I mean, this is not. This doesn't require the Smalling approximation yet. This is still just. This is true. That's just geometry. <laughs> geometry. We're going to make the approximation in a minute. Snell would say what? He would say um, this is really the angle of incidence in the material, right? So if this is n one and this is n two, he would say n one sine theta one equals. And this angle really is the angle of uh, refraction once you go. Why don't you go in? Let's see. No, I have those backwards. Let's see. N, yeah. Oh, I called them a different thing. Okay. No, let's see. So it's really N2 sine theta. Oh. Sorry. See, this is why we don't do review really fast. There we go. N2, N1. Because this angle really reflects. Um, no, no, it's 1 and 2. So this was right. N2 sine theta 2. All right. Yeah, yeah, because it peels away from the normal, so this theta 2 represents the index in, in 2. Right? Yeah. Okay? So you have two equations. Basically, these are just two equations, two unknowns. We can equate these for L and say S tangent theta 1 equals S prime tangent theta 2. And we have this. So you could solve for S1 in terms of S, or S in terms of S prime. I know. See? <laughs> Um, here's what you get. <laughs> it's just a trivial amount of algebra. And what you get is that S, and we'll just check the answer, um, equals uh, N1 over N2 S prime. Right. Basically, all the sine thetas become thetas, all the tangent thetas become thetas, and you just two equations, two unknowns, to get the relationship between where is the image appear and where does the object appear. Okay. N1 over N2, when you're a fish and this person is in the air, is a positive number. That means that the object is farther away than the image. Right? So this is S prime. This is the image. The object appeared farther away. You see the object is farther away? N1 over N2. And it, just, it really just comes from geometry. So there's a homework on that. Look at 34.4 and just you know, be familiar. But we're not going to do the magnification part. But we did cover sort of the how far away does it appear part. OK. OK, here we go. <laughs> I'll now just answer a few of these. And, and here we go. Why is the image virtual? Mm. The image is virtual because it's not being cast. It's not a real image you can cast on a screen. The nature of this image is that it's where the eye thinks the rays are going. So it's right there. Also, the fish would be upright, right? When you look in an aquarium, are the fish upright? Yes, because they're upright in real life. If it were a real image, they'd be inverted. All the fish would be upside down. Or maybe fish swim upside down, and we have it all backwards. I don't know. Uh, what's the difference between F modulation and F beat? Oh, yeah. So let me just say this when we don't have to write anything. If you do this formula, and you say this is the modulation frequency, this is what uh, comes out of the formula, the trig, you can get it's one half the, fa the frequency difference is the the frequency of the thing that modulates. But you hear two beats per cycle. That's why there's a factor of two difference between those two. All right, you can go. I can't answer all these. Uh, 
Uh, uh, we didn't do any Doppler velocimetry on the test. Did we do Doppler this semester? Yeah, we did like a really clear like Doppler shift for the interference. Kind of like when they moved. That was just to be able to do the interference. That yeah, that was grabbing something from last semester just to make an interesting problem. Thank you.